Good morning. Hey, uh, so today we're continuing our series on uh, Christ's return. And uh, so Dean was making fun of my title, which is I Never Knew You. And he opened up in the prayer meeting and says, I never knew you. So I don't think we should say that to each other, just so you know. Um, so, but we are going to talk about what really did Christ say about this topic? What, what is his parameters and what will he say to us? So um, it is an important topic and a special welcome to those who are joining us on, uh, online. So we uh, just want to commit this service this morning to the Lord and what he has to say to us. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for you that you are coming back again, that you are in our midst, um, in our hearts, and you will one day establish your throne on earth. And we praise you for that and look forward to it. And we just ask you to bless this service, help us to worship you in spirit and truth, whether there's many or few. In your name we pray, amen. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth in the same way that it is in heaven. Good morning, everyone. It is a blessing to worship the Lord together with you. Why don't we stand and sing to the Lord the prayer uh, that he taught his disciples when they asked about prayer. Give us day our daily 
You know, if you guys think back to recent memory, and some of that may be different, recent memory for you maybe five years ago, recent memory for you maybe five minutes ago, w things feel like they have changed, right? And things feel like they have changed over that, that recent memory. But it's good to know and be reminded in Scripture that the Lord does not change. He is, ever ch he is ever constant. There is no shadow in him due to change. And so he's a, he's a good fortress to whom we can continually come when the waves of life are constantly changing, when things are going up and down, the peaks and the troughs of life. The Lord is a solid rock, a constant companion, an unchanging God who never fails. Great is your faithfulness, great is your faithfulness, you never change, you never fail, O oh God, true are your promises, true are your promises, you never change, you never fail, O oh God.
like the spring rain, watering the earth. Let us press on to know. to be able to come into the house of the Lord and sing praises to him. This next song is based on Psalm 23 and a reminder of his, again, the restful place that he offers us. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet streams. Even though I I will not fear for you are with me you are with me your shepherd's staff comforts me you are my feast in the presence of enemies surely goodness will follow me, follow me in the house of God forever. of God forever. Your shepherd's staff comforts me. You are my feast in the presence of enemies. Surely goodness will follow me, follow me in the house of God forever.
Amen. The Lord is our shepherd and our rest. Please be seated for a moment as we have a reading of meditation to reflect on. Joseph Addison, when rising from the bed of death. When rising from the bed of death, o'erwhelmed with guilt and fear, I view my maker face to face, oh, how shall I appear? If yet while pardon may be found and mercy may be sought, my heart with inward horror shrinks and trembles at the thought. When thou, O Lord, shalt stand disclosed in majesty severe and sit in judgment on my soul, oh, how shall I appear? But thou hast told the troubled mind who does her sins lament, the timely tribute of her tears shall endless woe prevent. Then see the sorrow of my heart, ere yet it be too late, and hear my Savior's dying groans to give those sorrows weight. For never shall my soul despair her pardon to procure, who knows thine only son has died to make her pardon sure. Welcome. We are uh, almost in mid-September and I uh, had a few announcements for you. The big announcement um, or for this week is that Awana starts this week. We had our Awana leaders meeting uh, last Wednesday and um, one of the things we're doing today is we're handing out uh, flyers. We're meeting with our, our uh, partner church Cornerstone at uh, 2.30. So if you're able to go out today and hand out flyers, if We've got some of these on the front table. If you think of anyone you might see this week that you could drop a flyer off to, uh, feel free to grab one. If you want an electronic version, please let uh, Mike or I know, and you can send it to a friend. It is a great, uh, uh, it is a, it is a great program. I was talking. I called a few people uh, to follow up with them this week, and and uh, I'm pretty casual in how I describe things, <laughs> so. I was trying to describe it, and I said, well, when I was in Sunday school, we hated it, is what I tell them, and then, but we do a lot to enga- make it fun and engaging for youth, and it's very different, and so, um, and I describe a little bit about how Awana works and the benefit of them learning about the Bible, and I appreciate all the leaders and the planning going on, with so um, if you can join us today at 2.30, that would be, that would be great, and I, I thought share one story about sometimes meeting people or asking people or inviting people can be seem intimidating. I was up in, uh, in Milwaukee this week doing some work, and I woke up at uh, 4 in the morning. I was staying in a hotel room just north of Milwaukee, and, uh, and I, I, uh, I go, wow, I don't feel right. And I pulled the covers off the bed. It's 4 o'clock in the morning, and I found a, a bug in my bed, you know, and I'm going, oh, bed bugs. That's not good. And so, so and after you wake up at four o'clock in the morning and you find bugs in your room, you can't go back to sleep, you know. It's, what do you do? So anyway, went and complained and went to work and got out of the room and all that stuff. And, and I go to the job site and it's usually by myself at these job sites. But at this site, there was guys doing an installation and then they had dug this whole underground trenching to put this conduit underground and all by hand because it was they couldn't use a machine, which is hard, hard work. And the guys were there, and you know these are construction guys, tough. You know, one guy had a beard, but they this hard work, and you tend to think of them as you know nothing affects them. So I went there, and I'm a storyteller. So I, I said, "Where? Are you, what hotel are you guys staying in?" And they told me, and so I tell them the story. Well, the guy with the beard who looks really tough. He's still eating his breakfast at the job site. So I tell him the bed bug story, and he looks and he goes, oh, man, that gives me the willies. I feel itchy. I feel itchy all over. <laughs> and, and hopefully you don't feel that way now. <laughs> but um, I thought, I said, you know, 
even if people seem like they have everything set, people are the same. People have a common, they're the same. They have a common need. They have a common, we relate to things the same. And they spiritually have the same needs. Their children have the same needs. They need to know the Lord. We're, even though it may not seem that way, everyone has the same need. So if you can join us today and go out together, um, that would be great at 2.30. If you're not able to do that, if you could pray for us, if you could pray for the people going out and pray for that time that the Lord would create open doors, uh, not just this week, but over the next, next month, that people would be drawn uh, to Him. And not just to visit, but to be connected to Him. And so, um, anyway, I thought we could just pray together, and then we are, Greg, we're going to continue our new teaching series uh, with that. So why don't we pray while we're together here. Lord, thank you for a chance to stand for you. Thank you for a chance to, uh, to witness to you. and Thank you for a chance to um, um, speak on your behalf. And I do pray that you'd bless these efforts that you would go before us and that you would soften people's hearts and make a way for us. In your son's name, amen. Well, thank you very much for indulging my story today. We're going to have Greg come up and uh, continue in our new teaching series. And uh, once again, welcome to those who are online. So as uh, Dean mentioned, we're continuing our uh, series on preparing for Christ's return. And, uh, you know, Mike did a great job of really reviewing that with us, all the scriptures that are, um, that are associated, or many of the scriptures that are associated with uh, covering Christ's return, his imminent return. So, so what do we do about that? Like, what can we do? How do we prepare for Christ's return? Some feel that the key is to calculate the exact date and guess the right, you know, make sure we get that right. And many, that is everyone that has done that, 100% of them we know were 100% wrong as far as we could tell. You know, oh, no Christ yet, you know, has not returned. Maybe we need to have a big welcome sign on our front lawn that says, land here, Jesus. That's, that's what we should do. Well, I'm going to suggest this. Let's see what Jesus specifically said or warned us about. We're going to really see there are two sides. Um, and you are really pretty much, you're in or you're out, period. Um, you are a sheep or a goat on his left or his right. And I know it's not very inclusive, but uh, it's not me. It's Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's the Lord that's saying this. So when he talks about this, which is a good deal, he warns in parables often or metaphors and and I want to pick just a few, just a few of them, just uh, three specifically, and how that shows us how we can be prepared and how to be ready for his return. And it's not complicated, but it is essential. And these are the things that are going. Now, the, the, the titles of the subtitles here are really what the point is. So, I never knew you is not something you should go around saying to people, Dean. Or, I don't know where you are from, or, but we should be, re be ready, and uh, we're going to talk about how to get found. So let's uh, pray, and then we'll get started. Lord, we thank you so much that you made this clear. You are returning. Um, and that probability increases with every minute. Lord, you are coming. And uh, what we ask that uh, you'd show us about this topic, how we are prepared, 
but how um, we can tell others how to be prepared as well. And we just ask that you bless this time in your name. Amen. So, when you look at scriptures about this, the first ones we're going to talk about here are pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of, there's some symbolism, but it's pretty obvious what they're talking about. But as you get into others, um, some of it has harder symbology. And so, one of the things, the guidelines is you should look at context. So, not just the metaphor itself, you know, what the, the parable is, but what's said be, immediately before or immediately afterwards. So, typically, that's a good indication of what the subject is of the metaphor. So, um, and this is, you know, scriptural interpretation 101. Look at the context immediately before, immediately after, particularly if the word therefore is in the midst of it. So, um, you want to look at that. And th there's examples of this as well. So, I am, in, in this case, I'm not going to show you the verses because they're too long. I'm going to read them to you. If you want to follow along, there's uh, 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 book, uh, Bibles in your pews. There's bi you have uh, Bible apps, I'm sure. And, uh, um, or you can, you can be looking online. So, um, but follow along. I'm using uh, New American Standard, and at times I use ESV. And I point that out. Um, and, but mo for most cases, I'm new using New American Standard. So a lot of these are from Matthew, and so you'll, you'll pick up on that pretty well. So we're going to start in chapter, Matthew uh, 7, and starting in verse 15. And this is, Jesus is talking about a tree and its fruit. Verse 15, chapter 7 of Matthew. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. So there's a lot of this idea of sheep's. Sheep, we're going to talk a little bit more about sheep later, but here's a metaphor where sheep, there's wolves in sheep clothing. That's where, when you hear that phrase, this is where it came from. And uh, sheep are used a lot in Scripture to describe Christians. So, for example, John 10.24 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So, sheep are Christ's followers, Christians, and it's used over and over again, or Jesus used that often, and it's used throughout the New Testament. Grapes don't come from bushes. Figs don't come from thistles. Something produces the fruit of what it is inherently. No matter if you dress it up as something else, it doesn't matter. It's going to ultimately it'll produce what it is, what it is inherently. So good trees pr produce a certain type of fruit, or for example, pear trees produce pears, and uh, apple trees produce apples. So, and if there's, if we, there's uh, an idea of a good fruit and bad fruit, they'll inherently produce what they, what they are. The fruit tells you what is about what is on the inside. That's the idea. So, and we see this type of metaphor used very often. Now, why am I talking about that? Because of now he is getting into his, what, now he's talking about his return. Because this immediately follows this discussion about the fruit, right? So we're not talking about his return yet, but he talked about that. Now he's going to talk about his return, right? Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice law lawlessness." 
So who is it that will be prepared on that day? It's the one that does the will of his Father, he says. On that day. What day are we talking about here? Is this talking about the crucifixion? No. It's talking about judgment day. When he returns, when the return, when the book is closed, when the, the time is done. So who are these people that say, Lord, Lord, and apparently did good stuff? They seem to be on the outside doing good things, calling out, in Jesus' name, doing these things, which there apparently were. If you re look at other scripture, there were people that went about and said, oh, this is what Jesus is doing. I'm going to, you know, this Jesus guy, I'm going to do it in his power. Whatever that was. Excuse me. What was Jesus getting at? What, what did he say? Why did he say, I never knew you? If he is God, doesn't he know everybody? I mean, it seems like, why would he say that? What a strange thing to say. Well, the word know here, or knew, is ginsenko. Ginosko. Ginosko. I'll say that better. Let me start again. Ginosko. Yes. I have never been, and what this means, specifically, it's, I have never been in an approving connection with you. There are 24 different ways to say no in the Greek language. This means specifically, I have never been, I'm not with you. I'm not in this connection with you. I'm not in an approving connection with you. Gnosko. I, Christ, was not in your heart, and the fruit of your life revealed that. That's why he talked about the tree first. He doesn't say, you know, you just didn't do enough. Or, you did not say my name with the proper reverence. You were not religious enough. In fact, Jesus spoke against those things specifically, particularly the Pharisees and their leaven, right? He warns the disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees, which was hypocrisy, right? What comes out of a person reflects what's on the inside. That's what he's warning about. What's the fruit shows you what's inside. And that's what I don't know. I never knew you. What needs to be on the inside? Well, Jesus needs to be there. Again, it is about our heart. What's going on on the inside? And Jesus explains further in this passage. When he talks about building on, on the rock. So, here, here's the section. Sometimes, you know, 21 through 23, and people kind of yank that, can yank that out and say, well, you know, the, you know, what does this mean? And get confused by it, but you got to look at what's happening before. He talks about the tree, and now what happens after. What he's saying, therefore, what does that mean? It's a conclusion. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall. For it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and slammed against that house and it fell. And the great was its fall. So Jesus in this section explaining more what he just said about those he doesn't know. What is he talking about? He's explained, therefore be warned that this is what I'm saying about that. If you do these things spiritually, when tough times come, you're going to endure. Particularly the tough time of when I return. When Jesus Christ returns, you will be ready. It will be easy. And it will be how, that is how we and Jesus and you will interact. We'll get he, he says, you, meaning you, Jesus and I, or Jesus and you, 
will get to know each other way before that. And so we can say, well done, good and faithful servant. James 1.22 says, oop, can't, at least on my screen. Yeah, you can see it there. 1.22 says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So what his point is, if you just listen, listen to preachers online or on the radio or have to endure this every Sunday, you know, make it count. <laughs> Don't just evaluate the sermon to your standard scorecard. That is so easy to get through it unaffected without change. How do I know? Because that's what I've done. It's like, I hope I make it through this without falling asleep. What does he say? Don't just hear the word, do it. That is the warning. Let it change you. Let it get inside. Do it in your heart, not just for show. That is the warning. Listen and do otherwise, great will be the fall, and you won't be ready. Well, what, what does that mean? What do you need to do? What, what does that mean specifically, do the words? You know, what does that mean? Ha, you have to listen to the end. So you can't get through it that easy. So this is another section that he warns people about his coming, how to be ready. Luke 13, 23 through 29. This is where he talks about the narrow door. Luke 13 through 22, 13, 22. And he was passing through from city and village to another te teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there a few who are being saved? And he said to them, so stop there. The next he is answering this question, right? So the question is, are there just a few who are being saved? Answer, here we go. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will enter, seek to enter and will not be able to. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, the book is closed, it's over, you will not be able to. Once the head of the house gets up, and shows, you will begin to stand outside and knock on the door and say, Lord, open up to us. And they will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. Remember that, because we're going to talk about it in a few minutes. We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves being thrown out. And they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table of the kingdom of God. And behold... Some are last who will be first, and some will be first who will be last. So in this statement, I do not know whence, where you're from, is this is a different type of no. So it's uh, oyoda, oyoda. I know not whence you are, translated directly. You stand in no relation to me. There is nothing between us. Before they asked, are just a few being saved? Answer, I am answering your question. The gate is narrow. Very few. Many seek and they think they got it and will be surprised. But we were with you and ate and drank and we listened to you, sort of. Jesus fed 5,000, another time 4,000. And um, he fed people. So some people were there to get fed, right? You know, uh, we had the back, you know, the back to school giveaway. And 
Uh, Dean and Mike and I talked there. Now, the disadvantage I had is I did not have an interpreter. So maybe some of the people understood what I was saying. But there was nothing. Uh, I imagine Jesus experienced it too. He was, ye remember, yelling. He did not have a microphone. There was no sound systems there. So let's say a few hundred people trying to have them hear you, you have to really be speaking loud. Um, you could really, your voice would go pretty well. And, but I could tell when I was looking out, most people were going, nom, 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 nom. they were more interested in their food. Now, to be honest, people could have been here, you know, listening. They could have been, but it sure didn't look like it to me. So I felt very alone up there. So I would say not everyone was listening to me. And in the same case, they, they never said that they listened to him in that passage. Well, we know you said some stuff. But the people who were not there, and I think this is fascinating, the people who were not there from the east and the west and the north and the south, that means other people, non-Jews, they were from other countries, are, will be there. And they were not present. We were not present. We did not, were not fed. We were not there when Jesus spoke. And that they come, came anyway, they will be there. So being there... Didn't, wasn't a guarantee that you were in. Why? Because they heard the message of salvation of Jesus Christ and believed from some other means, either through Scripture or someone told them about it. Somehow they heard about it. That's, I, someone told me about it. And I heard and believed. And you have a story the same way. You heard and you believed. You were not present there. You didn't get a free lunch out of this. They heard and were changed. You were heard and you were changed. And they realized they were sinful before God. We realize we're sinful before God and believe the message of Jesus Christ crucified. And it's not of ourselves. In both cases, the people were trusting in being present or doing something. The, th the thought that this Jesus stuff is nothing more than a participation award. Those that hear Jesus and accept him as their Savior are changed inside because he comes inside us and changes us, and that is seen at, in the fruit of our lives. You can't, you can't have, not have fruit. It is the evidence of that change, but the evidence is not, the evidence itself is not the ticket. It's Christ is the ticket. Christ crucified. I know my sheep and that my sheep know me. Third thing, how can we be ready? So always be ready. This is the third thing he said, be ready. Back to Matthew 24, 42. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at that what time of the night the thief was coming, he would, not, he, would have been, he would have been on the alert and would have not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you, must, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So what does be ready mean? Does this mean we need to pick the day? We need, well, let's find out when it is so that we can be sure, so we're right, so we can have our welcome Jesus sign out. Does it mean to sell all you have, stand on a mountain and go, here I am, I'm ready to go and have a luggage with you, you know, and some things, you know, that, that you're ready, you know, like snacks and stuff. Well, I don't see that in Scripture. He never says that anywhere. I don't think the Lord will praise the one who guesses it right. I really just don't, because there's nothing about that. He will ask, were you ready? Do I know you? Were you doing what I asked you to do? 
do what I ask you to do until I got back. If I am in your heart, then the fruit of that would be, yeah, I, I couldn't help myself. So Jesus clarifies in the next verse what be ready means. Oops, let's see. I think I'm one step ahead. All right. Matthew 45, 24, 45. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave who his master finds doing so when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eats and drinks, drink with the drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he doesn't expect him and in an hour which he does not know and will cut him in pieces and aside him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So why does the evil slave do what he does? Because he says in his heart there's, it's there, an important, the most important place, if Jesus was there, he would not say this, my master's not coming, let's party, live for yourself, we don't need to do any of this Jesus stuff anywhere, way I wasn't listening, but I did, you know, that freed me a lot of it. He's never coming. Jesus returns and the slave is deemed not just evil, but a hypocrite. Why is he... Is he a hypocrite? So it's not just someone that doesn't go to church or anything like it. It's someone that says, I do, I, I, I think I'm a follower of Jesus. At least I, you know, did some stuff. But he's thrown in with the hypocrites, specifically. Why is he a hypocrite? Because he might, he might have talked about his master, worked for his master, but in his heart was far from him. Many people will say they follow Jesus, go to church and do, re do religious blogs, show up on YouTube. Many who pretend but will be in for a horrific, terrible awakening. The truth will be revealed about each one of us. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord sooner or later. Why not sooner? Because He is coming. So how do I, if that's something you don't feel like you're prepared for, let me tell you how to do that. How do I get found? How do I get ready? So in Matthew 25, 31 through 33, there's a little discussion about this sheep again. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. You know, it's funny. I was trying to look for a graphic that showed this and almost 75% of them had them reversed. So, you know, you want sheep on the right, goats on the left. Most people don't know what left is. So almost all of them, the, the goats were on the left. The goats were on the right-hand side. I thought, well, maybe this is from, like, Jesus. It's a reverse image of Jesus' view. I don't know. But there were, many of them were wrong, so I couldn't find it. But this is part of what might be called the kingdom of heaven descriptions. There's a huge group of them. And... Um, there are a good deal of metaphors, and I'm sure Dean and Mike and myself will go through some of those things during the series. For example, I'm going to specifically talk about the ten uh, virgins um, a, week, a few weeks from now. But the, so some of the metaphors you see in Matthew 22 is the wedding feast the, is compared to the kingdom of heaven. Um, having the wrong clothes uh, is an example of those, someone who would not get into the kingdom of heaven. The wise servant who is evil and the evil slave, that's in Matthew 24. Um, the ten virgins, the talents is here. The judgment of those who are right and the left and the sheep and the goats are here. So it's a big grouping of this, this types of discussion. 
that if you want to read ahead, you can go, go to there. So the real question in all of this is, how do I get to be, you know, how do I get to be a sheep? Um, Jesus said in Luke 19, 20, 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Well, the first thing to realize is you're lost. You're not with, you're not, you're the one, you're the lost sheep, right? You're a potential sheep. Here's the parable of that. This is in Luke 15. Let's see. Luke 15, 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there is, will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. So, for those of you who have gone through this, you at one time were this sheep. Just so you know, you were lost. I was that one too. Sometimes it can be discouraging. People read that, well, you know, I'm now righteous, so that, you know, no one in heaven rejoices over me. You know. But that's not true. At one point, you were a repentant sinner. You got picked up by Jesus. This was you. This is you. This is everyone that turns to Jesus that is found. Well, how do I get found? Well, he tells you. Recognize you're a sinner and repent. If you want heaven to clamor over you, repent. <laughs> want to change. Are there anyone who does, is there anyone who does not need to do that? Only those who think they are good enough. No one is good enough, including you. We are all sinners before God, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. But the free gift of life is eternal life in Jesus Christ our, our Lord. How do I get found? Say to Jesus, here I am. You can put a sign on your front lawn if you want. Here I am, Lord Jesus. I am a sinner. I need you. Don't hide. Take me back to the hundred, to the flock. Jesus says in 524 of John, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but passes, passes out of death into life. They're ready. He knows you. He knows where you came from. How does he know where you came from? Because he went and got you. So he can't say, I don't know where I got you. Yep, he went there and had to go get you. So he definitely knows where you came from. He will not you reject you. The flock will not reject you. And heaven will rejoice. Here I am, Jesus. I accept what you did for me on the cross. Paying for all my sins, past, present, and future. I place my trust in you alone for salvation. I am yours and you are mine. That's how you get known. That's how he knows where you are. And that's how you become ready. You will then become one of his family, adopted, his bride being prepared, and his servant in which he will give you tasks to do. You get pretty known pretty well. When you work for him, you get, you're going to be his bride and you are as part of his family. If you're not, if you don't do that, you'll be none of those things. When he, then he will come into you and know you, know you from where you are from because he found you and picked you up. And you'll be ready for his return. These are the things that we talked about. Is that you can be known. He will say, if, if he doesn't know you, that will be a rude awakening. And he, you want him to know that he picked you up so that he knows where you're from. You want to be ready. 
And we talked about how to be found, how to accept Him as your personal Savior. And I want to close with this verse, Hebrews 9.28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. Let's wait for Him. Let's be ready. And let's pray, and uh, we'll have uh, Chris come up and lead us in breaking of bread. Um, and if well, I'm just going to pray a prayer of salvation. And those of you who are maybe online or those who are here that don't know, uh, your status. Just pray with me. Lord, thank you. Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to be found. I, here I am. Lord, I am lost. I don't know where I'm, what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. And I need you to take me back. Lord, I need you to find me. I need you to bring me back. Lord, uh, find me and I accept you finding me. Lord, and uh, I admit that I'm lost. I admit I'm a sinner. And I can't do it without you. I can't get right before you on my own. Only you can do it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died for me on the cross. That your blood paid for my sins. That your flesh was torn for my iniquities. That I deserve everything, every bad thing that ever happened. Lord, I deserve that. But you paid for it. You paid for my sin. And I ask that... I wish that you'd come into my life and be part, that you know me and I know you, that you know where I'm from and I know where I'm from and I'm from you, Lord. And I, you adopt me into your family. You make me your bride and I will serve you, Lord, as your servant. And we just thank you for this time as well as we remember what you did on the cross for us. In your name, amen. This is the time together when we are going to take communion, the elements of the bread and the cup, and partake of the Lord's Supper together as a body. We have the elements sitting over here on a tray. If you have not already grabbed those, now is a good time to do that so we can all take communion together. The Lord's Supper, communion, was instituted by the Lord during the Passover before his crucifixion. And he took what would have normally been the normal Passover meal and added new meaning to it. That would be remembered by us for generations since then when we partake of it together as the body of Christ. Here is that scene playing out in Luke 22. They're eating together. They've enjoyed most of the supper together. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you, with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We eat the bread and drink the cup together as a body of Christ to remember what he has done and to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. During this time, we're going to partake of the cup and the bread as you reflect in your heart and enter into a time of reflection and pray. We'll also be praying out loud if you feel led to pray and offer up thanksgiving before the body of Christ, feel free to do so. I'll open and close our time in prayer during this time as you feel led to partake of the cup and the bread. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your Son. And we do this now in remembrance of of what you have done, Jesus, for us. This cup of redemption is the new covenant in your blood. We drink it in remembrance of you. And this bread, this Passover bread, Lord, we eat. It is your body broken and given for us. As the body of Christ, we thank you and unite our hearts to fear your name and to bless you for what you have done for us. 
we die your death and are raised your resurrection because of you. Thank you, O Lord, for all these things.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let us stand and worship the Lord together. thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond the fade. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out. Above all else, till my purpose remains, the art of losing myself in bringing you praise, everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades, never ending, your glory goes beyond. I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord, let justice and praise become my embrace, to love you from the inside out, everlasting, your light will shine with
Blessed be the Lord who covers all our transgressions. Go in peace, brothers and sisters, and may the Lord go with you all.